Thank you for inviting me um, to give this lecture. So I have no relevant financial disclosures, but I do have to disclose that I have a, uh, a problem reading, apparently. Um, <clears throat> this talk is called esophagogastric leak, which I noticed like yesterday. Um, <laughs> I thought it was esophagojejunal leak, so for the past you know, several months I've been collecting videos and, and things like that, and I realized yesterday I was like, oh, Kyle <laughs> wants me to talk about esophagogastric leaks, which must be gastric pull-ups, like esophagectomy leaks, because he doesn't have any, and I have plenty. So <laughs> I will answer any questions you guys have on esophagogastric leaks, um, but that's not gonna, what I'm going to talk about. So um, we're going to start off with a case um, of a total gastrectomy. This is a 44-year-old female. Let's see if I can get the video. 44-year-old female who had stage 3 gastric cancer, and she had the typical uh, preoperative chemotherapy and came to surgery. And this is my standard technique. I like to use the Orville uh, for esophagogastric or esophagojejunal anastomoses. When I pull the, the plastic thing through, I cut it like this because I've had them fall back in the esophagus before, so it's just a little trick. Then I can leave it sitting there while I go ahead and find my jejunal limb, find a piece that's going to... Uh, come up nicely, do your division. <clears throat> and then um, I like to cut the mesentery uh, on the rule limb pretty aggressively because you're going to cut it off anyway. And so if you can make it look ischemic, that way if you drop the two limbs, you'll always make sure you pick up the right one. <laughs> These are tips and tricks from mistakes made before. Um, and then now you can just cut the string and pull the rest of the plastic piece out. Marry the two, and you can see that there's a little bit of a kink. You have to make sure that that's straight, um, and that's because I bring my um, uh, I bring the stapler in through through a right-sided port or a left-handed port, um, which may or may not be a good idea. And then um, I like to minimize the candy cane here to close the defect with a linear stapler. And then every case that we do, um, we'll do an intraoperative leak test, either methylene blue or saline submersion. This makes sure that there's no boneheaded, you know, technical errors. You shouldn't leave the OR with, you know, some hole or staple misfire that's in the that you can't see. And then um, the curl closure on this case, if if needed. And then we'll finish off the operation. Okay, so I want to talk about this. This is my great drawing I did on the, tr the trackpad of my Mac. Um, <laughs> so anyway, when you're going to do, uh, we all know that when we're doing sort of jejunal anastomoses, you want to maximize your mesenteric uh, to anti-mesenteric ratio for the blood flow. So something like this would be the worst place to put your stapler, right? Because that's got a relatively ischemic corner, potentially. And something like this might be good, theoretically, it's a little exaggerated, for, for that concept to make sure that you have maximal um, blood flow there. But in esophagojejunal anastomoses, this limb, this candy cane part should be short because not only does it grow over time sometimes, but because it's so proximal in the GI tract, it can be very symptomatic. And so <clears throat> where is the perfect spot? Um, this is a, you know, just a throwing it out there. But how big, how far um, between the staple lines do you want? Some people will say zero. So you want the, staple line, the stapler to go right next to the esophagus. And some people will say a centimeter, and some will say whatever. Everyone says something. Um, but I don't know what the perfect, the perfect distance in that area is. Um, but it's something to consider. And so now let's watch this a little bit slower. Um, and the video's not perfect for this detail, but bear with me. So here's a stapler going in. And then I grab the, the end to sort of maximize my angle. Now I like it to be really, I like it to be like nothing next to the staple line, between the staple lines. Um, 
So it's pretty close. And so you would think, well, um, it looked good in the operating room. Um, but on about a week post-op, about five days post-op, her amylase, her JP amylase was elevated. So we, I always put a drain in uh, after these anastomoses, and we routinely check JP amylases. Whether or not that makes any difference can be debated at another time. But generally, if it's over 10,000, then you've got something going on. She was clinically fine. She's 44, bouncing around, wanting to eat, like wanting to go home. And so I took her to endoscopy. And this is what we found. And I think it's that corner. Um, the, the Rulin looked fine. And then we spent some time washing it off, washing it off, washing it off, searching for the hole, and there really wasn't anything. So what do you do? These are your options. Conservative management, clips, covered stent, double J stent, endovac, reoperate in general. So in this case, I think we'd all agree, this clinically insignificant leak. We found it with a JP amylase, so we treated her conservatively. I tortured her by keeping her NPO. Um, I had a J-tube in place. Uh, I kept her NPO for a couple, a couple weeks and, and pulled out the drain. She did fine. Now here's another lady. This is a 75-year-old, uh, also with stage 3 gastric cancer, status post uh, pre-op chemo. She was not as healthy as the 44-year-old. She had a... Uh, post-op MI, and she had seizures, and she was weak, and she looked 100 years old, and um, she just had that kind of a course. And then on about a week post-op or so, she had an elevated white count. Um, she was on the floor, but still just kind of weak. Um, we got a CT scan. There was some fluid at the anastomosis, nothing too terrible. So we scoped her, and this is what we found. Uh, her surgery was unremarkable uh, as well. Everything looked fine. So this one is a little bit bigger. You can see some necrosis. Um, at first, I thought it was really small, but then as we dug into a little bit, it's 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 sizable. So with this one, what should we do? Um, she's not necessarily overtly sick, but she's not well either. Um, so I didn't. I wanted to do something a little more, a little more definitive than watch her. I considered doing a double J stent because those are nice in patients. Um, be, because if you have, a, or as opposed to using a covered stent, covered stents people are afraid, as I'm I sometimes, that they're going to migrate into that rule limb and you're going to have to take patient to surgery or something. And so a double J is really nice. But the problem with a double J is the abscess cavity has to be developed on the outside, and I wasn't sure that that has happened with her. Um, so I went ahead and put in a, put in a stent here for this. Now my tr trick for this is I use as long a stent as I can find. I'll use a 12 or a 15, um, cent centimeter to make sure that the overlap in the esophagus is as much as you can possibly get. I barely put, barely cover the anastomosis, um, but make sure that the esophagus is really nice and overlapped so that you can get as much, uh, stick in there as possible. Um, so we did that for her, left it for a couple weeks, she went home, came back, had the stent removed, and then um, it all healed up. So that was great. She also eventually did need a CT-guided drain uh, that was placed for a few days as well. Now here is another one. I actually, this is not my video. I don't actually have the clinical story, but um, <clears throat> what I'm told is the person was sick. <laughs> and this is a much bigger defect. Uh, we've got nearly, this will loop a little bit. Um, we've got nearly 50, per, or maybe even more, more than 50% circumference uh, dehiscence with tissue loss, and it's kind of ugly. And again, she's a little bit sick, so we'll stop. Hmm. Can you advance the slide? Oh, there we go. Never mind. Um, okay, so with this lady, let's say she's sick. She's got a bigger, she's got a, she's not sick enough that you want to take her to the OR, but she's, she's not doing well and uh, a much bigger defect. What do you do with, with her? Um, you could consider stenting, um, double J. I don't know if I would do that, but, um, endovac or reoperate. 
So this is an interesting slide I got from Dr. Steve Leeds, which <laughs> shows the uh, some data for evac with esophageal uh, esophagectomy leaks. And I don't know why they had such hideous results with stenting, but either way, it's kind of interesting. Um, on the one on the left, the mortality rate for stenting was 83% versus 12% for evac, um, and similar data on the other side. So what this hap, oops. So what Dr. Lee's decided to do was evac this patient. Sorry, there we go. Um, this is after one change and this is long-term, so. So what about reoperation real quick? Um, when do we ever reoperate for EJ leaks? Um, I think maybe technically, if you have an early technical failure, which you shouldn't have if you do an intraoperative leak test, and even if you do, maybe you can use endoclips, uh, you can reoperate to wash out things that you treat endoscopically or place drains, but usually you don't. Usually you can use CT-guided CT drains anyway. And I suppose if the endoluminal approach has failed, you need to consider something more definitive, diversion, resection. That's, again, uh, really rare. But thank you very much. Again, I'll answer any questions about pull-ups if you want. <laughs>